Oh, hey, hi, hello, welcome to Hollywood Party. I'm glad you made it back. Today, we're getting to know a woman who didn't have a traditional career in Hollywood, but in a sense, all roads led to her. So grab a drink and join the party. Practically every person we've met so far, I've mentioned Irene Mayer Selznick. She's like whack-a-mole, she just keeps popping up everywhere. So we might as well get to know her and see what we think. Irene said she had three stages in her life, daughter, wife, and theater. She's really underselling herself. Irene pretty much grew up with Los Angeles and Hollywood. That's why she's quoted in so many biographies, because she's seen everything. Her autobiography is called A Private View for Good Reason. I honestly can't think of anyone who's more Hollywood royalty than her. Irene was a second daughter of Louis and Margaret Mayer, born April 2nd, 1907. Edith, or Edie, was born a year and a half before. Louis said he was happy to have girls because boys leave and he could pick out his sons. Kind of like what he did with Irving Thalberg. Louis had immigrated when he was three years old. His mother had a few children die young, so he was far more attached to her than his father. He and his dad had a scrap metal and marine salvage business. Irene remembered her father as ambitious, a go-getter, emotional, and intense. Her mother was friendly, had a thirst for knowledge, and was very generous, especially to her relatives, which Louis could not stand. A quick note about LB. Plenty of movies and TV shows depict him as having a very stereotypically Eastern European Jewish accent. Get that out of your head. He did not even sound like that at all. He sounded American. He sounded kind of like FDR. So LB got out of the scrap metal business and he bought a theater in Haverhill, Massachusetts. It was originally a burlesque house, but he rebranded it into the Orpheum, cleaned up the acts and made it a family place and even had an all woman orchestra. It was such a success that he opened a second theater. Irene went to her first premiere at four and a half years old. Although they were moving up in the world, LB did not want to have a lavish lifestyle yet because in his grand scheme of things, he was still hustling. Each time LB levels up, Edie wants to live the good life. I won't mention it every single time it happens, but just know that it really makes Edie have Veruca Salt vibes like, I want it now, daddy. This is what LB would say. Never mind now, this is short. It is the future that counts, the future is long. The first movie star to come visit them at home was Francis X. Bushman. The girls really thought they were big doings then. They also got parts as extras in a Mary Miles Minter movie. I know that name means probably nothing to most of you, but she was involved in a super big scandal in the 1920s. We won't get to it today, but I promise I'll, I'll get back to it. LB was a founding officer at the original Metro company. He left there, went to work for Louis Selznick, hated it and hated him, and he left after one month. For years and years, he would call anybody he didn't like a Selznick. So kind of like how we use the term Karen. Margaret did see to it that the girls were little ladies and they took elocution, piano, and violin lessons. Edie was a girly girl and Irene was a tomboy. Irene was also left-handed and they fixed that by tying her hand behind her back. Yes, this absolutely resulted in a massive stutter. H words were apparently very difficult for her. Later on when David would call her on the phone and he knew she couldn't say hello, he would say, if it's you, whistle. While her parents were away in California scoping it out, in 1918, Edie got the Spanish flu. That's all Margaret needed to get her girls out to California. Before the movies, California was known as a great place to go to improve your health, specifically for TB, which is exactly what Edie caught the second year they were in California. They had to move from a bungalow to a bigger house on Sunset Boulevard to be able to quarantine her. Her parents were terrified Irene would catch it, so she had to sleep on the porch. It was a health thing, they were not trying to be mean. Edie ended up being moved out to Palm Springs for over a year to recover. I'm sure that was really tough. 
During this time, Irene started at the Hollywood School for Girls, a private school where girls like Jean Harlow, who was younger than her, and all of the DeMille children attended. While her parents were looking for a house, they lived in the Hollywood Hotel, which Irene remembered as seedy and exciting. This hotel was built in 1902, but when heiress Almira Hershey, yeah, like the chocolate bar, purchased the hotel in 1906, she expanded the hotel from 16 to 250 rooms. There were dances every Thursday night, and practically every single silent star stayed there at one point in time. The hotel is no longer there. It is now transformed into the disgusting mall that is Hollywood and Highland. While at school, Irene learned to ride horses, and she loved it. She would get up early every day and ride with LB and his pals, mostly lawyers and bankers, to the Hillcrest Club for breakfast. There used to be bridal paths all through Beverly Hills back then, basically where the medians are now. At about this time, our boy Irving Thalberg shows up. LB warns the girls, he's attractive. I don't want you girls to get any ideas in your heads. Ever. He doesn't warn them just once. He was constantly warning them. I mean, they're both 15 and 16 at the time, and Irving was 23, so he was the only young man that was ever around their house. Imagine how dorky teenage girls are around a cute guy. Both of these girls were just mad about him. LB said he wasn't going to have any young widows in his family, and Irene thought, if he was only healthy, there might be a chance. But she saw him as a man without a future. That is unbelievably tragic. Like, thank God he didn't think that about himself. The big MGM merger happened after Irene graduated from high school, so she couldn't even really walk into class and boast about it. Super anticlimactic for her. But they did get to go to Europe with LB, so he could straighten up the whole Ben-Hur mess. Like true Americans, none of them spoke French or Italian, but Margaret said it didn't matter because Yiddish was spoken everywhere. I thought that was pretty smart of Margaret, but apparently Yiddish is a mix of Hebrew and German. So if you're an Italian Jew, you might not know German, therefore Yiddish is probably something you might not speak. I did not know that, and neither did Margaret. Everything Irene heard at home was top secret. She said there were four people, four lives, boiled down to one, and that was my father's. I know it's easy to say, oh well, it's just how it was back then. This seems to be the dynamic in families where there is one super powerful person, a head of a studio, a company, a country, it doesn't have to be a man, go watch the ground. LB did take his family everywhere with him, and if he hadn't, they would have been totally isolated. He had told the girls at a young age to tell their mother everything, and friends were not to be trusted. So they really didn't have friends at all. Irene loved going to second previews to see what was cut or added and why. Edie wanted to be an actress and LB said no, he did not want any of his daughters working. He nixed college for Irene because he thought it would put ideas in her head. Yeah, that's kind of the whole point. He told her to get interested in golf because that's something she could do with a husband. Okay, I really hate when girls are told to get into sports so they have something in common with their husbands. When a dude I'm dating starts taking up knitting, that's the day I'm going to start giving two good goddamns about sports. She ended up taking up tennis because she enjoyed it, and that worked out better for everyone in the long run. Men were divided up into three groups for her. Older, married, quite interesting men. The glamorous ones, definitely taboo. And the unknown ones, suitors. She was told to stick to our crowd kind of Jews. Well, she didn't fit in with old world Jews and she wasn't allowed to go with picture people, and Gentiles got a definite no. The girls both thought their parents were conspiring to keep them single forever. MGM stars were highly trained and had to follow strict rules. Same with the mayor girls. They had to behave like all eyes were on them. They had to always be neat, nails short, no polish, no smoking, low high heels, and only certain shades of lipstick were okay. A good reputation lasts forever seems to be the family motto. They had to always be on time or early, and they were only allowed to eat wholesome foods, nothing canned. They weren't allowed to chat with the most popular person at the party, but they had to seek out the wallflowers and give them attention. They weren't told what to say, but what not to say, what to think, but not what to feel. So Irene banked all of her feelings and made sure they were totally private. In photos of her as a teen and a young adult, she was very elegant looking, but we might say that she had a resting bitch face. Now that we know she was just hanging on to the only thing that was truly hers, it helps give another layer to those pictures when you look at them. 
Irene said that her family gave her everything, except privacy and a sense of worth. Obviously, they were expected to be virgins, and LB wanted them to marry one as well. Edie told Irene they should avoid this at all cost, it will ruin our lives. One evening, LB came into the girls' room and gave them the book Studies in the Psychology of Sex. He told them to never show it to their mother because she was too innocent for that. She had two kids, dude, but okay. Then he shut the door and never spoke of this incident again. In 1925, LB agreed to get the girls all new clothes for a trip to New York. They needed to make an impression because they were getting around the marrying age. The day Irene went onto the studio for a fitting, of course, the clothes came from the studio, why not? It was also the day Joan Crawford came to MGM for the first time. Irene remembered Joan as moon-faced, overweight, and had frizzy hair. See, MGM did do really good makeovers. This was also the year that LB built a house on the beach in Santa Monica. And just like the girls' clothes, he would get the studio to build the house as well. He had set designers working six days a week, three shifts a day to get it done. Their neighbor was Jesse Lasky, and I'm sure he just loved that. LB preferred Santa Monica because it was more casual than Beverly Hills. Yet they had four rooms, three servants, a driver, and a handyman. It's not very casual to me. The house is still standing today. After the mayors left, the house was sold to Pat Kennedy and Peter Lawford. I remember Robert Osborne telling stories of going to parties there when he was new to Hollywood. Sundays at Oceanfront, which is the house's name, became famous for big buffets. The girls wanted glamorous people invited, Margaret wanted relatives, and LB wanted no one. Typical dad. LB's favorite guest was Mr. Hurst, who used to call him Son. When Hurst started building Marion's little ocean house, Irene went to go check it out. Marion apparently never came during the building, so whenever Hurst was there to oversee some different aspects of the construction, Irene would come over and get lessons on design or sculpture or whatever was going on that day. The day the pool was completed, which is the only thing left of the main house, Hurst said they would both christen the pool. He went into the basement where there were crates and crates of swimsuits of all sizes for their guests, except his size. Needless to say, he was not pleased. When it came time to date, LB said, I will never tell you who to marry, absolutely free, any choice you like. However, I reserve the right to say who you go out with. In 1926, the Mayfair Ball was held at the Biltmore Hotel on New Year's Eve. One of the guys at the studio had gotten two young men as dates for the Mayor girls. LB had been assured that David was not like a Selznick and that he was a clean boy with good character. Almost a decade later and LB still couldn't stand Louis Selznick. He hated Lewis's extravagant Park Avenue abode with tapestries and statuary and a Japanese butler. It kind of sounds like Auntie Mame, I'm into it. David was not the best date. His brother Migran was there and his table was full of really rowdy, fun people. And David was stuck at the table with his boss. Irene accused him of being drunk and he said, not drunk enough. Needless to say, LB was pleased that the date did not spark into anything else. Months later, she was at a housewarming party, and as she goes down a spiral staircase, out swings David O'Selznick on a trapeze. Who is keeping a trapeze in their house? He takes her over to play tennis with his brothers and a bunch of other guys on the beach, and he asks her to come back the following Sunday to join them for a game. Sundays were also buffet day at her house, so she can't stay all day, but he keeps asking, why don't you hang around and see what's doing? I don't know, dude, why don't you just ask her out on a proper date? Maybe because he was still dating Jean Arthur at this time. She liked him and she didn't like him, and he wanted to bring her down a peg. So on the occasion of their first date, she met him at MGM and they drove past the old Thomas Ince studio in Culver City. And David said, that's the kind of place I want to have one day. They went to the Coconut Grove and she was aware that he didn't make that much money, so she found a nice medium priced dish for herself to order. Well, David ended up ordering three courses right off the bat. How do you eat three courses while drinking and then dance? I would just go to sleep. Irene came home at a quarter to two in the morning and LB was waiting for her. He was pissed. How was she to know there was a curfew? She had never been on a date before. Over Christmas, LB takes the family to New York because Irene keeps seeing David and David was let go from MGM during this time. He refused to apologize to Hunt Stromberg, who yet again wanted, quote, lots of tits in a movie. That seems to be his thing. So Irving had to let him go. On Christmas Day, a gigantic basket of red roses shows up for Margaret, and LB thinks, oh, it's from his boss, Nick Snack. How nice. 
Uh uh-uh, it's from David. This is how he got Margaret on his side forever. When the family came back, Irene and David really started going steady. And it was a lot easier since he was over at Paramount now. Here's a little backstory on the Selznick family. Lewis, the dad, made lots and lots of cash. He wanted to build a studio in Florida, but that did not pan out, and he went broke gambling. David wanted to restore his family's name, and Myron wanted to punish large companies, so he wanted revenge. David initially got his job at MGM because his father had sold the rights for Ben-Hur to Nick Schneck for exactly what he paid for them. So Nick, being grateful, said, if there's anything I can do for you, and there was, the job at MGM. Myron became an agent because an old Selznick star, Owen Moore, who was Mary Pickford's ex-husband, needed help with his contract at MGM. So Myron went in and got him way more money than he initially asked for. There was an older brother, Howard. He was kind of the odd man out because Myron belonged to Mama Selznick and David was the daddy's boy. They were really close. Like, Myron would put David to bed every night until he got married. Yeah. Now that they were serious, David began the process of trying to undo everything LB had molded Irene into. He found value in the joy and pleasure of life right now, not later, like LB. In Irene's mind, David really wanted to be like F. Scott's Fitzgerald, but without the pain or penalties of excess. He wanted her to speak up and give actual opinions on previews. She had been to millions of previews, she knew what she was talking about, but just wasn't allowed to speak, at least not before this. He really helped her start finding her voice. Speaking of her voice, she went to see a specialist at UCLA about her stutter. They recommended that she started using her left hand more. It didn't totally disappear, but it really helped her out significantly. While sitting on the beach one day, Irene meets Janet Gaynor and they strike up a friendship. This was her very first friend. She needed someone to talk to about boy stuff. And of course, LB did not approve of having actresses as girlfriends because he said they were after him and not her. In this case, that was totally not true. They were friends for the rest of their lives. When David started proposing, he did not stop. He gave Irene a five carat solitaire that she had to wear on a necklace because the rule was they couldn't officially be engaged until Edie found someone. She finally did and she got engaged to Bill Goats. She then reminded her father that he had said there would be a time to spend and she wanted to cash in on that promise now. They had a knockdown drag out fight and she won big time. LB promised her that in addition to the wedding, he would buy her a trousseau, a diamond bracelet, an ermine coat, and a Cadillac. He also had to repeat all of that for Irene. David was just very eager to get things going, but Edie dragged everything out like by eight months because she said, this is my period in the sun. I told you she has got Veruca Salt vibes. Edie had a gigantic wedding at the Biltmore. Two days later, Irene and David went to see LB in his office, and they said they'd like to be wed at home at the end of April. He freaking flipped. People needed time to recover, he said. They just finished buying Edie her presents. They were being selfish. David said he'd waited long enough, if you get my drift. And Irene sided with David. She told her dad that now she was getting married, David would come first, and she just couldn't fly two flags. He called her a traitor, and she fainted because she had never pissed off her dad before. They never spoke of that day ever again, and therefore her wedding preparation was a real blur to her because she felt like she was walking on eggshells. They were married in Irene's home like she wanted, and Adrian, the designer who was married to Janet Gaynor, he designed her gown. By the time they returned from their European honeymoon, she had her nails painted and she had started smoking. David was basically a hedonist. All he wanted was quantity, quality, and variety. While they both had a romance with each other, they also had one with the movies. His dreams were her dreams. All Irene ever aspired to be was a wife. When she published her autobiography in 1983, she admitted that that was not only old school, but old country thinking. David did want kids, but not if that meant that his lifestyle had to change. His attitude with parenting was hire, delegate, go out and enjoy. When they did have their first child, Jeffrey, David was oddly competitive with him. Kind of like, watch out for this guy, he's coming to take my spot. It's weird because David was super close with his dad. I mean, really close. Prior to their marriage, he had hid his gambling problem from her. Irene thought only Myron and Lewis had that vice. So when she finally found out, David said that she should accept him as he is without criticism. I don't even know what to say to that. That is the dumbest thing I've heard. 
Oh boy, on that note, let's freshen up our drinks. The Selznick party day was, you guessed it, Sunday. This all began when they started renting out Colleen Moore's old house. 2 p.m. was when tennis began. Then they would have about 30 people over for supper, and that went well past midnight. There were so many people hosting parties on Sundays. Who was actually going to the damn parties? Of course, during the week, there were nights when David would call up and need a party just whipped up in less than an hour. Whenever anyone, especially Irene, did something that he thought was impossible, it just furthered his lifelong belief in luck and magic. Irene and all of their servants had a hell of a time getting him out of bed in the mornings. She figured he might be narcoleptic or have a thyroid problem. No, so his doctors put him on Benzedrine. He was told to take five tablets. Wow, this was like the miracle drug. It gave him extra days in the week because he didn't even need sleep anymore. The doctor called him back and said, oopsie doodles. I meant five milligrams, one tablet, not five. David did not acknowledge until much later that abusing these pills might have given him extra days, but it took years off of his life. Irene's first male friend was Paul Byrne. I'm not gonna repeat his saga, but go back to the Irving Thalberg party if you need to be brought up to speed on old Paul. As I said, Irene had gone to school with Jean Harlow and did not think Paul should marry her. Actually, what she said when he asked if he should marry her was, quote, you'd blow your brains out. Irving was the one who called David with the news and David said he was going to kill Jean. In the end, Irene really did respect Jean for not airing Paul's dirty laundry, even though the press made her look like a villain. When David's father died, LB pounced on him to return to MGM. He said he'd give him his own unit, the works, everything. As we know, this is happening right around the time that Irving Thalberg was having another heart attack. Irene never thought her father took advantage of Irving, and she felt that if there was competition between them, it was because the Schneck brothers tried to cook that all up. Okay, LB definitely overworked Irving and did some tricky business with him at the end. Trying to replace him with David was one of those things. Either way, David hated being an MGM. During this time, LB had a large share in the 20th century studio, and he gave a huge chunk of it to Edie's husband, who worked there. He then lent a lot of stars to the studio to help build it up. This helped so much that they ended up buying Fox. Unlike David, Bill Goetz was happy to get help from his father-in-law, especially in career matters. Edie's career was entertaining. The Hollywood Reporter said an invite to one of her parties was the ultimate get. No doubt, they were very elegant, chic affairs. The dinners would be by candlelight, no chandeliers. She allegedly served the very best food. But not every party is a big get. Even though they were totally adults now and living separate lives, Edie was still super competitive with her little sister. When Irene started collecting Impressionist paintings, Edie had to start doing that as well. Edie's collection was massive, just to stick it to her sister. When she passed, the collection went up for auction and sold for $85 million. In 1934, Irene finally built her family home. It was on a 2.5 acre lot, just down the road from Charlie Chaplin and Pickfair. So it's tucked up in the hills behind the Beverly Hills Hotel off Sunset Boulevard. It's still there, so is Edie's. They are both massive homes. I do have pictures up on Instagram because you need to see them. I just can't do them justice. In the middle of getting the new house set up, Nick Schneck offered David Louie's job. He did not take it, and he just ended up going off on his own. He started Selznick International Pictures at the studio that he and Irene passed on their first date. It should be noted that Irving Thalberg gave David money to start his own studio. See, Irving was an awesome guy. He also passed on Gone with the Wind. He did that because he knew Selznick was one of the few studios interested in that property. And he said, quote, I think it's sensational. It will make a terrific picture with a great role for Gable. Now get out of here with it. After their second son, Daniel, was born in 1936, the Selznicks went to Honolulu, where David finally read Gone with the Wind and started working out its many kinks. That movie became his top priority for years. He didn't sleep and he took more and more pills, but they did not stop doing their Sunday parties. Irene started taking Benzedrine to just to keep up. Ugh. Her account of George Cukor's firing from Gone with the Wind is different than what's reported in his biography. She says that he was fired over dinner at their house. I don't know which account to believe, but George did call Irene in the 70s when he was doing the book on Q Corps, and he asked her if she knew the real reason why he was fired, and she said yes. 
and he did not ask why. Just like a weird interaction all the way around on that one. The night of the Gone with the Wind preview in Riverside, Irene burst into tears when they arrived. Because what did all of these strangers do to deserve to be the first ones seeing this movie? It had dominated her entire life for almost three years. She was a sobbing wreck at both the Atlanta premiere and the New York City one. But by the time they got to the LA premiere, it was much better. I'm not going to go into details about how much David obsessed over this film, because this is not about him. The link to watch The Making of Gone with the Wind is on my blog, so you can go there for all of your needs. He comes away from this movie being even more addicted to pills, and then has a new addiction of wanting to be around crisis all the time. She claims that David left for the Oscars in a different limo than her, and that she also sat at a different table. I mean, there are multiple photos of her at the same table that night. Nevertheless, she was pissed off about that night for decades later. Irene got pregnant again, and David said, it's up to you. So yet again, she puts his needs first, and they only end up having the two boys. During World War II, Irene wanted to get involved and do something, so she became a juvenile probation officer. Her job was to decide if a girl should stay with her family or if she went off to a foster home. She loved this job because no one knew who she was until she went to a charity event as herself and someone from work was there, so her cover was blown. Around this time, Margaret had to get a hysterectomy, which changed her forever. She had multiple breakdowns, became depressed, and complained of constant pain. The doctor said she was a hypochondriac, so she went to a sanitarium. She was in and out of mental health facilities over the next decade. There were no hormone therapies at the time, and hysterectomies were the common cure for a lot of issues. It really broke Irene up to see her mom go through all this pain, and she was unable to help. LB and Margaret separated in 1944. They divorced and he eventually remarried a woman named Lorena and adopted her little girl. Around this time, Irene had started taking sleeping pills and one night before she conked out, she said to David, how can you do this to me? Leaving him awake all night thinking, oh my God, what the hell is she talking about? The next morning she told him, I need to see my therapist before we can even talk. So when she got home, she was convinced her marriage was over. Even though she still loved him, she just was not happy. David confessed to an affair. Irene says she was unaware that he was even seeing Jennifer Jones, but no one in Hollywood believed Irene was that naive. She explained to David that she changed what she was willing to tolerate. He said he wanted the old her back and for her to want him however he was. Dude, that's not how it works. During their first year of separation, David gambled away $1 million. At times in his life, Irene recalled, while running his company, Home, health, and children were sacrificed to the business. The business was jeopardized by gambling. The day their separation was announced in the papers, all of the wives of the major producers in town sent Irene flowers. Also, this announcement was during Labor Day weekend in 1945. Nothing good happens around Labor Day weekend for these people. Paul Byrne dies, Irving dies, this marriage dies. Just don't go anywhere or do anything on Labor Day if you're in Hollywood. Now that she was single, Irene figured, hey, I want to have a fling and then I'll get remarried because I'm great at being a wife. Katherine Hepburn, Spencer Tracy, and George Cukor all gang up on her and say, hey, why don't you get into theater? Of course, LB wants her to go into the movies. He asked her to name him one person that didn't wind up broke in the theater. David was very supportive. He wanted to buy her her own theater, which was very him and very over the top. Her goal was to find new or neglected playwrights and make their dreams come true. Her first play was Heart Song, whatever. Then she gets the chance to produce A Streetcar Named Desire. In the middle of rehearsals, she has to go back to California because her youngest son, Danny, needed to have surgery. David never showed up. And that lit her up pretty damn good. So she finally sued for divorce. They didn't exchange money, just assets. David ended up marrying Jennifer Jones in July of 1950, and they had one daughter, Mary. He even asked Irene if she would be Mary's guardian if anything happened to Jennifer. What the hell, David? Before Brando got the role he was most famous for, I know dudes love him in The Godfather, but I think Stanley is really the role that put Brando on the map. Anywho, they tried to get John Garfield or Burt Lancaster. Burt Lancaster would have been super hot in this. LB came out for the previews and he told her, you don't have a hit, you've got a smash, just wait and see. Daddy was right, 
George Cukor threw her opening night party at 21, and David showed up and was just bursting with pride for Irene. They were clearly best friends. I love how supportive he was of anything she wanted to do, even after they were divorced. Tennessee Williams ended up winning the Pulitzer for the play, and then they took it to London. Laurence Olivier directed his wife, Vivian Lee, in the play for eight months. His direction of the play was labeled clumsy. Vivian went on to be the only non-original Broadway cast member to make the movie. Blanche is essentially an outcast, so that kind of makes sense. Also, Vivian won her two Oscars playing Southern Bells for two different Selznicks. You have to follow a hit with a hit. So Irene did Bell Book and Candle. David ended up buying the rights to that script, turned around and sold them for a profit to Columbia. Good for him. When Irene did The Chalk Garden, she hired George Cukor to direct it. He had not done theater for decades. So yet again, another Selznick has to fire George. There were no hard feelings. There's typically one really juicy story that I have for every party, and this is it. LB had a love of horse racing, and he bred horses. He finally got a horse in the Kentucky Derby in 1950. Apparently, the horse was raced under Bill Goetz's colors. So he was new to racing, and he didn't take LB's advice on running the horse the week prior to the Derby. The horse was named Your Host, and he ended up coming in ninth and LB was livid. He called Bill later and he just lit into him and Edie grabbed the phone and he blasted her dad and he finally told her some really awful truths about herself. Edie wanted to get even, even though her husband's entire career had happened because of her dad. In 1952, Bill agreed to co-host a party for Adelaide Stevenson with Dory Sherry. This was the year after Dory gave LB the boot from MGM. The couple would make offensive jokes about LB at their dinner parties. LB never spoke to Edie again. When LB was dying of leukemia in 1957, Edie was annoyed with Irene. She thought that her sister was dramatizing his condition. She never once tried to come visit, although after the fact, she said she pleaded to see him and was refused. I'm gonna side with Irene. I think it's a load of crap because David came to visit, Katherine Hepburn, June Allison, plenty of people came to visit him. This is a direct quote from LB's last will and testament. <laughs> him. I make no bequest to my daughter Edith Goats, nor her children, nor to any other member of the Goats family, as I have given them extremely substantial assistance during my lifetime, through gifts and financial assistance to my daughter's husband, William Goats, and through the advancement of his career, as distinguished from that of my former son-in-law, David Selznick, who never requested nor accepted assistance from me in the movie picture industry. Oh, snap, son! That shit was on the front pages of all the LA newspapers. Danny suggested his mom reconcile with Edie years later, but Irene thought Edie betrayed her dad and didn't take care of their mom. Irene really respected LB, but she adored her mother. Apparently, when Irene became a mega successful Broadway producer, this really chapped Edie's ass. She considered Irene, on a good day, barely her equal, and now she was her superior. In the end, they never really reconciled. Towards the end of her life, Irene reflected back on her parents' warning of strangers trying to use her. She said, it's true, I've been used a lot, and well, very well. What could be a better life? One of her friends said this about her. She's so smart, so interested in everything. Irene was about being aware and cutting through the bullshit. Essentially, that's the problem between the two sisters. Edie wants to live life in a fairy tale, and Irene wants to see life how it really was. She stopped producing Broadway shows in the early 60s, and she ended up traveling for years, sometimes alone, sometimes with friends, sometimes with her kids. She lived in an apartment at the Pierre in New York until she passed away on October 10th, 1990 from breast cancer. She's buried at Hillside Memorial Park in LA, right above her mom. And yes, both of their graves are marked. Now for the eternal question, would we want to party with Irene? She does have resting bitch face, but she will literally talk to anyone at the party. And if we have any kind of problem, she can probably figure it out in a pinch. I think she's in. I know Edie's parties were so chic, but she can also translate to stuffy. And I just don't get that vibe from Irene. Besides, any gal who's no bullshit is all right with us. I do want to make a quick note that I have a YouTube channel up. There are just so many goodies about our guests and I hate to waste them. 
so I have little videos of super fun extra facts. For example, with Irene, there is a whole story about Cary Grant getting Howard Hughes to charter planes for Irene during Christmas so she could get her son to and from boarding school. Twice! And that's not even the whole story. Why would I want to keep all these fun things to myself? So the link for that is in the details below. Next week, we'll be getting to know a guest on their birthday. Ooh, ooh. See you then! Thanks for listening to Hollywood Party. For more information about this episode, head over to hollywoodpartypodcast.com and follow us on Instagram. If you like the show, tell every single person you know. Like and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Anchor or whatever else you use to listen. See you next week. That's that noisy girl.